So Fede, I, um, I watched your video on the road about a week ago. I took some notes. And so with my memory fading, I'll just go through some points. Uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> and they're sort of in no order. So I remember, you know, understanding a little bit better later in the video what you meant earlier. Um, I think in general, one thing just to explain up front is, <clears throat> you know, I think everything is unique like a fingerprint, right? Fingerprints, you know, are well known. They epitomize being unique. Uh, so there's that framing there, right? But if you look at the fingerprint, I mean, they all pretty much look alike in another sense, right? You can tell it's a fingerprint right away. But the idea is that's how everything is. It's like apples. Two apples have a lot of differences. Individual fingerprint, you know, uniqueness to them. Uh, they have a lot of similarities, right? And so this is all the way throughout everything. Everything is fundamentally unique. Even an electron that has certain quantities has its own quantum properties. You know, and its location and something that makes it unique. So even in the extreme example of things that are very, very uniform, like in their electrical charge, very uniform, excuse me, are um, unique. So in this sense, if I say that I have communicate my own way, it's not an arrogant thing. I mean, everybody does. You might as well be asking me to communicate in Spanish so you'd understand me better or or accepting that, that I can make demands on you that your communication not be unique when it's fundamentally unique. On the other hand, we can say, look, there's certain patterns that we're asking for or interested in. My point in my video was that, you know, it's not really the English language, but I'll, I'll mention this a little bit. Rather, it's the ideas I'm trying to convey. You know, not all ideas are easily conveyed in language. In fact, I think most of them are not. And, uh, and I think artists use artistic languages to try to communicate, you know, more subtle and difficult to communicate. Uh, you know, ideas, concepts, emotional uh, content. So, um, so one thing I've noticed is that I put I, I, if you know, there's a lot of ways to to get to a particular conclusion, or that conclusion's opposite. Well, I like to present multiple of them at once. I don't like to go through just one. I like to include the complexity of things. And um, the other thing, though, is yeah, I, I think I mentioned before, I have a, a language, a technical language project that I've had for 20 years plus now. Um, I called it Language 7.0. And the idea, and that's the first version, the version numbers would go down, and the idea is that language one would be sort of finally cleaned up language. Because, and there's a lot of rules uh, to how I do this processing of language, and I think it's backward compatible. I don't try to invent, um, I, I don't, so, like, warp some definition that a word has. I, I refine it. You know, I do this thing called extensional analysis. I try to ask, well, what do we really mean by a word and abstract a new intentional meaning and see if this works better? So, for example, taking values out of words and keeping them in sentences and paragraphs. All right. So basically, that's, that's why I don't think it's arrogant. Um, just like it's not insulting to say you have your own unique way of communicating and to a certain degree to accept that yes to give you feedback but there's different ways of giving feedback um where i just think we have some you're taking your own interpretation of things in a way that i don't think i've directly conveyed but maybe indirectly i don't think i complain that people don't understand me and i was thinking about this through as i watched the video i think i watched the video one and a half times or something like i went through halfway and then got distracted and went through it again. And as I was going through, I was realizing, you know, I do, I have complained that people don't understand situations, that I'm also saying what my understanding is. But, um, but I don't expect them to understand it the way I understand it. I mean, they don't even come up with an understanding of the situation. You know, they have a block against it. It's like they can't see that it's there. 
I mean, an example is uh, an irony of it is, for example, Americans. Americans don't really get, they know, hey, we've done some bad things and we had some racist ideas. If somebody gets beat up or some, the jerkiest guy in the neighborhood does something rude to, you know, racially motivated. They don't get, you know, the Philippines. America has Nazi level atrocities on its history. It's just, we haven't lost the war yet that where we had to face them, but the world knows, and people like me face them, real atrocities, like killing a whole village except for one woman that the whole, you know, troop then rapes all night. You know, real atrocities. You know, killing 10-year-olds that are civilians just because they're old enough to carry a weapon. Putting people in concentration camps so that anybody that doesn't go to the concentration camp, in the old definition of the word, is uh, automatically a criminal. Putting this innocent civilians in camps where they're disease and no food and they're taken away from their farms and what have you. And then anybody that doesn't go there is obviously a revolutionary. <clears throat> you know, atrocities. Theodore Roosevelt and many people in that era uh, did real atrocities. Okay, Now people just don't or comprehend this and it's a metaphor knowing your own nation for knowing yourself you know they kind of just they say yeah but they don't really visualize just how how atrocious it was you know uh, the Indian wars so-called uh, and just the way Indians were um, brutalized just by everybody until they were finished off and just how intentional that was and just how a Absurd and again Nazi-esque the, the notion that w we're civilizing them was you know And who the barbarians really were and you know, I think we can move on from things like this But you know Germany having to face oh, Hitler is better than us still glorifying some of the most atrocious people um, Theodore Roosevelt made treaties in Asia illegally without telling Congress the Senate. <coughs> now, I don't think people have to understand it the way I understand it, but I will complain if they haven't really even dealt with the f facts, right? They haven't come to some understanding about these facts, that these are atrocities. Even, uh, even in a culture that approves of war as a way of disputing things. Um, so, uh, I mean, Americans are still here going, they hate us for our freedom. That's their self-understanding. We're kind of a free country. They don't like that. And it's like, no, the people that hate us uh, just remember the atrocities. Even though we didn't win lose World War II, somehow they remember. Now, was that clear? I think some people would be confused by that presentation, but I, I think it was clear. I think a lot of Americans would be confused by what I just said and think a lot of confused things like, what do you mean, are we admitted, we understand, no, you know, I don't think so. Um, but non-Americans probably would go, yeah, I, I see what he was getting at with the, with the atrocities of America, but I don't see how that relates to being clear. Um, what am I supposed to do about that? Because I feel like I, I made exactly with that segment. Um, <clears throat> I have also complained about people taking the wrong interpretation. But that too, to me, is not saying they should get exactly the right interpretation. It's more like they made assumptions and start talking about, well, you said the blah, 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 blah. It's like, no, I didn't say that. And that's what I mean about uh, not being misunderstood. You know, it makes sense to me that people would go, hmm, I kind of get this and that gist of what Piero said, but, but I'm not sure if I quite get it. And, you know, hold off some of those assumptions. Because I think we're really looking for questions, not answers. I think that basically what we call an answer is better thought of as just a better question. You know, what kind of a god is the sun is, you know, replaced by? What kind of chemicals is the sun is replaced on? What kind of energy generation? You know, you narrow down questions. And you can place those questions as answers like, you know, what kind of a god is the sun? You say, well, it's not a god. Done. I'm done. But really, it's a question. It just breeds a new question, right? Okay. So I think if people have a question about what I meant, that that's better than if they think they, they got it exactly right. As long as there's some 
conveyance of ideas. Uh, I think it's a higher signal to noise. Um, and a lot of what people experience as understanding is, is just an illusion on their part. You have the two people going, yeah, that's it, yeah, that's it. And they're actually thinking different things often. So I communicate in this way um, both because of, of planning and working on it, but also I'm working on it this way because of my predilections. I, I would like to argue that, you know, even English isn't my first language. Uh, you know, emotion is my first language. You know, artist imagery, the, the, the language of imagery, you know, could show you three pictures and that in a particular order would convey a particular message compared to if it was in another order, obviously different pictures, right? And so trying to put um, these ideas that, that I can f work with it in my mind with, with images, with the imaginary imagination, the power of imagination, um, uh, it, it has to, it, it has compromises, just like uh, sp uh, talking philosophy in in, the lang in English when your first language is Spanish, has certain, um, you know, certain issues that a little, you know, certain words uh, uh, might be less used or the concepts, you know what I mean? They might map, or you might tend to put your verbs at the end of the sentence when you start talking past or whatever, go back to your own grammar. It's the same thing with me. I really feel more that I have worried about, um, you know, a structural uh, uh, language as a structure for emotion and imagery, um, and words being a, a special case. Just like logic, it seems universal. You can apply it, but sometimes, you know, some things. Pure logic, you can't have x equals a in matters of love and character. And it's hard to mathematize beauty and stuff. But it's easy to discuss it with imagery, so it's it's like all language is sort of on the logical end to that. You know, it, it cuts off and makes certain things difficult, um, difficult to deal with the way I actually think of them. And I would rather try to come up with um, a way of speaking, ex a way of expression uh, that's a personal language. And again, I abstract this a little bit from art. I think we're all unique, and, and speaking, even in ordinary circumstances. It has an art, at least an art and engineering kind of aspect to it, and that um, the the best way to understand someone is get to know them and understand the you know kind of the way they talk, the way they express themselves, and that's the purest. When you try to pretend, well, everybody has one way that they're supposed to communicate themselves, and we can, you know, a universal model, and everybody's supposed to be with reference to it, is sort of an approximation of <clears throat> what's really going on, which is people are unique. And you have to learn some of their unique things to really get what they're saying very well. Um, and this this is not such a terrible thing if you just accept, as I've accepted, or it hasn't been terrible for me to accept, that all understanding is partial. You, you can't understand something fully. You get that feeling of fullness. It's just it's past some threshold of satisfaction that you've got enough of the meaning. Um, so... Um, just to emphasize that, you know, I think everybody is a unique communicator. So I don't find it arrogant to point out that I'm a unique communicator. Um, you said that, okay, you, you have these things you couldn't control, but at least you know you come off in an uncontrolled way. That, that I find perplexing because uh, haven't I been acknowledging how, some of these things about how I come off and you're going, well, at least I know, really? Are we at least talking about your way of coming off, or at least we're actually talking about mine. So I think me acknowledging how I come off is not really an issue and just shows a little bit that you're kind of just frustrated with um, an apparent arrogance or something. But there is a, a unity of arrogance and humility in the fingerprint and skepticism and relativism, you see. Um, like, uh, again, with the Philippines, one of the things forever and still against the Philippines is, oh, they eat dog. And it's like, get over it. <laughs> I mean, it's meat. I had somebody who was coming over, decided not to argue with him, came over, was talking to me about, well, it's just wrong to eat dog because you can't eat an animal that understands this or that. I'm like, well, they're stupid dogs. But I didn't go into that. But that was their theory. They you went, know, oh boy, it's okay to eat cows. It's just this kind of relativism of somebody else thinks that you can make a fine, fine meal from a dog. And frankly, 
I'm fine with that, but that's not where my head is at. I don't want to eat a dog. I'm not choosing to eat a dog based on the flavor. I mean, I have had a lot of close relationships with dogs. Um, so, uh, so it's not, um, uh, you know, so I could be proud of the way that I communicate and unwilling to change it. And still, that doesn't mean it's, it's just relative. That's where I'm coming from. It's like, I eat dog. Is that really so gross to you? Let's talk about that. Why? What is it? Um, the arrogance that I would say I could be my own way. But compared to the fact that I think I don't have any choice, that everybody is their own way, and I'm just accepting that fact. So which is it? You're saying I should try to be the way everybody is, which there is no such way. You know, see what I'm saying? I think that that part is what I'd like you to think through, how that swirls around. And any step of the process, you'll see it makes sense, but, but you really need to look the whole cycle. And that goes nowhere. Um, like, for example, maybe you could be more specific. What, what could I do? I gave this metaphor. Maybe you could tell me, yeah, just say 2 plus 5 equals 7 and leave the 8 minus 1 equals 7 to another video. And I could say why I'm willing or not willing to try that. I'm interested. You know, I used to, it's like, it's not that I don't care if people understand me because I care. I'm interested to see how much they understand me. Like, it's not a matter of understanding me or not. It's how much and in what way. Uh, they understand me, and I'm interested in that, but I'm not going to change what I say in order to maximize that. That's almost manipulative by my standards. Now this know thyself thing, um, see, knowing yourself interferes with being able to communicate with other people because you simply find how unique in things that can't be stated just by repeating a cliche that's been in the language for hundreds of years, you know? and and so there's a balance there. Um, and I have a, a history of, of thinking about this thing. It's Socrates', Socrates is only dictum. And, oops. And um, I, uh, I really am just trying to provoke what you said you're willing to do. Instead of saying it's hard, like it's an art form, like it's trying to describe how to stay balanced on a skateboard. No, this, is, this does reduce to analysis, knowing thyself. I think one way, one technique is just to know the history of your country because people have a sense of identity with their country and by facing hard facts about what the country has done, it, that helps face hard facts about what you as an individual have done. In a way, something other citizens in the past have done that you benefited from is similar to things that you've done in the past because that's kind of a different person than you are now. You've grown or changed, right? And so there's, there's a pretty good analogy there. Of course, the other general way is just have some ethics and morals where there's some head checks. And when you feel, I'm going to kill that guy, you, you have a moral system go, ooh, head check, That's you're not supposed to really think that it seems unhealthy. You're supposed to pause and look at yourself and what's making you feel that way, and you'll learn something about yourself. You might learn that I do have a good reason. Or you might learn, you know, generally, if you have a decent morality, it's going to help you uh, Head check yourself from your behaviors. All right. Um, you said anti-natalism is understandable. I mean, my system's understandable. That five level of epistemology that I was using when I was talking about why don't people get this? Well, could you just tell me why don't you get it? You think that's not understandable, those five levels? Because that five levels, it's a dependency layering. I couldn't imagine making anything more understandable than that. It's almost too simple. Uh, it's so understandable to me, and, and I would like to know, I mean, is that, I've, to me, it's fairly straightforward. Starting from perceptions, the rest you can just re-deduce. You have, you have perceptions, you process them. You deduce materiality, you deduce your material thing that's, that's doing that process, and you get a third degree, a third person view of self, and then you have these, you, yourself, me, myself, and I version of, of a self, and you have a uh, 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 you and they, you know, other person's sense of self with all kinds of character deg de uh, degradation, uh, gradation, or I have no idea what I was going to say there. Um, five levels of epistemology. I mean, what, I don't get it. It's like, um, I think it was Kuntika, is, if I get that pronounced right, but it's funny when you always read things. 
was talking about, no, you have to have thought before perception. I'm like, well, that's a deduction. You see the perceptions, and then you perceive that the perceptions are getting processed, and you perceive a feeling like as if you are the thing processing them, the sense of self. Then you deduce, yeah, there's pro there must be something, you know, there's the perceptions, but there's something doing something with the perceptions. There's something that's changing kind of thing. And, uh, and yeah, that makes me a materialist, and I speculate that yeah, there's a material world generating this for us, but me as a subjective individual, I'm still starting with the perceptions. But see, that's an example where his understanding is different from mine, but he got the question, and it's got the starting from perceptions thing. My chart is specifically to point out that what we know about, like, you know, to say, I think, and we feel really certain about that, but we don't really know what thinking is, what that word means. But to say, I perceive, that that's more solid. It, it means I'm having this experience of this flow of sensations in all of these different sense spaces. It does not get to the fundamental bottom of an of a E equals A axiom, and that's the difference between my system and the classical system is that I'm starting from our experiences. You start to get these abstractions of A equals A where you're pretending two fingerprints really are equal, they're both fingerprints, or two apples really are interchangeable, they're both equal. That's, that's at a higher level. That's at a higher level where you started to filter out um, from the whole set of perceptions. Those ones you really want to count, and the reason you do it is because then there's some interesting processing tricks you can use. You know, you can use mathematics if you define those those rules. But it's a subset of the full set of all of the rules, which are really just the perceptions are happening to us, and we notice patterns in them. Right? Patterns like that kind of pattern is a fingerprint. That kind of pattern looks like an apple, and it comes from a tree, which is a kind of pattern. This pattern seems to beget itself over time. And all of these thousands of uh, knowledge statements that we could easily agree on. And, the question is where do they come from? How are they built up? And it's from perception. It's your own personal interaction with perception. It's the establishment of the idea that the, of, of, that it's a perception of something, and the something is a system. And it is exists as a, a material system running on its own, just as you must, and to a certain degree they are independent in that both of those systems have their own you know if you go away it could still be running if it goes away you could still be running they both have their own self but you never get above this fact that like one of the ways the sun might not rise tomorrow for you is you die your system start stops and you can't you, to me it's very important to understand how that is the basement that is the foundation that's the bottom of everything we know is that if i die the sun doesn't rise tomorrow for me all of the theories about but it'll rise for other people i believe them it's just i'm saying they're ordered it's important to get, important to get the order right why because when you get all this stuff collated and formed out in a clean way this clear stuff then we can start building on top of that more complicated things like social systems you know, like, like, uh, it, it's just, I mean, we're still attacking countries and expecting to be greeted as liberators by the barbarians there. And that if we just kill a lot of them, they'll, they'll get the idea. We still think that. Um, we had a little bit of fear of that after, um, well, I think World War Two made the GI think he was doing a good thing since he was fighting somebody so terrible and he didn't know how complicit the Western powers were in, in producing Hitler. And then he came back, his kid went to Vietnam, is like, I'm not going to do this. A lot of people did it, but then it got out. And then they got scared. But we don't want another Vietnam. And they did much, you know, went for more covert uh, kinds of things. And then Bush comes along and it's just like, no, let's double down, back to torture. You know, we went back to torture because we tortured. We were waterboarding the, the Filipinos. You know, with the more majority of them dying in the end. So, um, yeah, that's a little big bundle of threads, you see, but they they sort of thread together. All right, cheers. <laughs>